Hello everyone, my name is Steve Spain and today we're at the Peoria Riverfront Museum in Peoria, Illinois at the Golden Age of Disney Art Exhibit. During the next few minutes we're going to take a little stroll down memory lane and look at what went into the making of those great classic American films that Walt Disney gave us in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Now, um, to a Disney geek like myself, films like Snow White, Pinocchio, Fantasia, and others are American treasures and are just as important to our popular culture as our live action films. So hopefully you'll enjoy the tour and, uh, well, follow me. Walt Disney was involved in animation for many years before Mickey Mouse, but for most of us, Mickey Mouse is synonymous with the start of Walt Disney's success. And what we have here is an original animation drawing by Ub Iwerks from the very first Mickey Mouse cartoon that was ever made, a film called Plane Crazy. Now I know a lot of people think that Steamboat Willie was the first uh, uh, Mickey Mouse cartoon created, but that was actually the third one. Plane Crazy was the first one, a film called Gallop and Gaucho was number two, and Plain Crazy was number three. Now the reason that Plain Crazy is well known is that was the first cartoon with synchronized sound, and it enabled Walt to gain a national audience, a national distribution deal. But Plain Crazy is where it all started with, and you'll notice that Minnie is there too right at the beginning. Walt felt it was uh, uh, very important that he have a, a partner, uh, a love interest, and so Minnie Mouse was there as well. Now, as I said, this was done by Walt's friend, Ub Iwerks. A lot of people say, gee, Ub Iwerks, what kind of name was that? Well, he was a, a Dutch background, but he was a close friend of Walt's, and they worked together in the animation business when they were in Kansas City, at both the Kansas City Film Ad Company, and then later, Walt's business, which is the Laffergram Company. Now, sadly, the Laffergram Company ended in bankruptcy for Walt. But when he moved to California in 1923, he wasn't there very long before he wrote a four-page letter to his friend Ub, and he said, Ub, California is the place to be. The weather is great. All the talent is here. Uh, the industry has moved from New York. Come out here and join me, and I think uh, we'll have a great success. And Walt was very persuasive, and uh, shortly thereafter, Ub came out and joined Walt Disney, what was then known as the uh, Disney Brothers Studio. So in 1954, Walt Disney once said that I hope we never lose sight of one thing, that this was all started by a mouse. Well, this, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the first heartbeats of Mickey and Minnie Mouse right here, playing crazy, shown first May 15th, 1928. Now, this early type of animation, the analog animation, every single thing was done by hand. Every frame of these films was done by hand. And the early movie projectors and all the way through modern day movie, mechanical through the film gate movie projector, these were uh, shown and gone through the film gate at a rate of 24 frames per second. That was the number of images it took to fool the mind into thinking they were seeing continuous motion instead of a succession of still images. So here we have an example of the early uh, pencil animation here of one second of animation from Walt Disney's uh, building a building film from 1933. So the distance between this drawing and this drawing would be one second of time. So this would consist of 24 drawings. Now we have four here, but there would be four or five additional drawings in between these to fill those out. But you can get an idea here of what it looks like. And then if we go to the final cell animation, animation cells were celluloids. They were placed over each of the drawings and then hand traced or inked and then painted on the reverse side. And then those were placed and photographed one at a time over a watercolor background. So we have the pencil animations here and then we have an example of the finished animation here. So this, you can see all the, the, the work that is involved in just one second of animation. Now here is an example here of Mickey Mouse on one of the uh, his Hollywood celebrity friends, and uh, I enjoy these caricatures of Hollywood celebrities. The only problem is, as I get older and my friends get younger, they don't really know who these people are, but it's still a, a fun thing. People ask all the time, what are these red numbers here? Well, this is a color call-out drawing from an early black and white film. 
the palette for the black and white films were um, very limited. There was black and white, and there was only four or five shades of gray. This guide here, on top of a sequence of drawings, would be a guide for the painters to indicate which of the shades of gray they would use on these particular characters. So we go from these early black and white films, and then we're going to step forward here. And not too many years later, look at all of the different colors on these color call-out drawings. We would go from four or five colors to a palette of probably 80 to 100 colors here. And we would move all the way to the first feature, uh, 1937 Snow White, and there would be a palette of over 1,500 colors and shades for Snow White. So there was tremendous innovation during the 1930s here. Here's an example here of finished animation. When I say finished animation, this would be animation that was placed under the camera and photographed one frame at a time. So instead of the drawings, we have the uh, traced, inked, and painted cells of the three little pigs here placed on a watercolor background. Let's go over here and I'll show you some finished animation that's kind of neat. Here's Donald and his penguin friend Tootsie. Um, this is what's called a pan or panoramic background because not only would the cells be individually photographed uh, one frame at a time, but they would also be not only replaced, but they would be moved down in increments. If you see this film in live action, you see Donald chasing Tootsie the penguin throughout his house. This background actually represents three different rooms in his house. Uh, but you can see how beautifully painted some of these uh, watercolor backgrounds are. Uh, Walt was very fortunate when he started his uh, animation studio, when it really started to grow in the early 1930s. The country was still in the throes of the Great Depression, and jobs of any kind were hard to find, but jobs for artists were really difficult to find. So Walt had his choice of all the top artists, and then he taught them how animation works. So most of the watercolor background artists were actually came from uh, the accomplished uh, California Landscape Watercolor School, and that's a good example here. Here's another good example of how the animation process works. Again, on a pan background, we have Mickey from this edge to this rock in the film, swimming to the rock. That action takes about two seconds on film. Two seconds at 24 frames a second would be 48 frames. So addition, in addition to these two surviving uh, Mickey cells here, hand inked and hand painted, there would be 46 additional ones of these animation cells photographed individually and moving along the water there, taken from 48 original animation drawings and placed on this watercolor background that a background artist took several days to create. So obviously it was a, a tremendously labor-intensive process, uh, and that's why we won't see films like this ever again. It's just impossible to do in today's business model. So. Now this is kind of an early Mickey. Later on, Mickey got redesigned a little bit. Here's a, a piece, a finished animation setup from The Pointer in 1939. This is the first film where Mickey was redesigned by um, uh, Disney animator Freddie Moore, who was a Disney legend. And you can see here he has a little more articulation in his limbs, he has a pear-shaped body, but the big difference with the new Mickey was his eyes, pupiled eyes with lots of white to give him more expression. So this 1939 film was the very first film, and basically Mickey has stayed the same uh, today. So a few more examples here of watercolor backgrounds. One of the things about the watercolor backgrounds, in this exhibit you can study these and absorb them. When you're watching the films, you're paying attention to the characters and the action and the story and so on. Uh, here, however, you can see the attention to detail, and, and, uh, and this is from a, an early Donald Duck film called Officer Duck, but even the little iridescence in the bottles and the different textures of the wood and the ceramic uh, dishes there. Uh, there's a little, uh, probably a spittoon or something back in the background. But I often thought that if you would see this, this little painting in someone's home, you would think, my, what a nice little uh, still life that is. And I don't think they'd have any idea that it would be a cartoon background. It's, it's that um, artistically done. So, 
There's a few more things here. This is from uh, Bill Posters. Uh, this is original animation drawings. This would be before the cells were made, hand and inked. This is from Canine Caddy, where Mickey learns to play golf. And let's go down here. Um, this is kind of an interesting, in 1941, uh, they also decided to push the envelope with the design of Mickey and Minnie a little bit by making Mickey and Minnie's ears in perspective. Prior to that, and even after that, Mickey's ears simply floated. If Mickey's ears would be here, and he would turn, they would remain. It was easier to animate and, and people. But on here, you notice, they went to the work of making Mickey's ears in perspective at different angles. And they made about six films like this. Um, and they decided that the effort really wasn't worth it. The cost wasn't, wasn't worth it. Uh, so there's only six films. They're great films. Uh, but that was an experiment that they ended with. Here's also a, a Goofy, again on a pan background. He and the bull are cavorting around this background. Again, they would start here and go the, the full length and back in this particular film um, on this train platform. All right. Some more examples of background work, some of my favorite. This landscape here is from uh, The Little Whirlwind in 1941. This is actually Minnie Mouse's front yard here. Um, this one here is Huey, Dewey, and Louie's clubhouse uh, from Truant Officer Donald. Now, when you see this background in the film, you will see this background. You'll also see smoke coming out of this window because they've caught something on fire. Uh, you don't see it here because that was done on a special effects layer, celluloid layer. There's a whole group of animators who worked just in special effects, drew them and then inked and painted them. Uh, there would be things like fire and smoke and rain and snow and wind, that sort of thing. That was a whole separate division, but those attention to details added to the realism. Um, here's a very interesting, uh, from a goofy short, here again you can see all the detail, all the little stonework here. There's even some little uh, rendered photographs of what appears to be Goofy's girlfriends there. Uh, you know, this, these things fascinate me because when you study them in still time, uh, you can really see the artistry that went into them. All right. Now here at the museum, they have a little interactive thing with, uh, with kids. They can watch this particular cartoon, but they can learn to be their own sound effects uh, person here. So we have uh, uh, blocks. Uh, we have, you can play the spoons. There's a tambourine. My favorite is... There's the little xylophone there. Uh, I don't think I should give up my day job, but, <laughs> but the kids have a good time. They can add their own sound effects to the cartoon. And then they can understand a little bit about the process, too. So, all right. Now let's head over here to the first feature. First feature here, done by Walt Disney, was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Now the importance of um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs cannot be overstated. Walt knew early on that if he was going to be a big success in the film business, he would have to get into feature films. The Mickey Mouse films were doing fine, but he realized that people came to the theater to see the main feature. Um, short subjects were fillers. They were allowed the people to get their seats and get popcorn and so on, and they enjoyed the Mickeys, but there was a definite ceiling on what kind of money he could charge for those. So he knew he could uh, have to move to uh, the Snow White and the Seven Words, the feature animation, if he really wanted to make money, and also the fact he can do things that he couldn't do in short subjects. Uh, he wanted to do things in the features just like regular live action features, character development, stories, uh, relationships, all those sorts of things. So uh, people were very skeptical when Walt Disney announced that he was going to have uh, do uh, work on a feature film, people thought, gee, no one will sit through a cartoon of an hour and 15 minutes. The, the bright colors will hurt your eyes. Uh, you'll go blind. There's all kinds of crazy things there. 
but in fact, Snow White was a huge success, an unbelievable success. In fact, it quickly became, upon its release, the all-time box office champion of any film, a position that it held until 1939 when Gone with the Wind overtook it. So it was a huge success, and Walt was on his way, and the studio was in strong position then. Over here, and I'll show you a nice piece of art. As a collector, there are two things that we look for in pieces of art that we pick. Either an iconic image of the characters or a key moment in the film. Here would be a key moment in the film here. The witch handing a, the a Snow White the poison apple. Uh, the film takes an hour and 20 minutes, but this particular scene is only a few seconds. So to have two match drawings from that key scene is pretty special. Now here's a piece of finished animation, animation cell on the background. Um, here we see Snow White making the gooseberry pie near the end of the film. Um, there is kind of an interesting little story that uh, uh, some people say it's a myth, uh, a few people say there might be some truth to it, but it's an interesting story. When Walt started working on Snow White and he was um, working from the original Grimm fairy tale, uh, Snow White was described in the original Grimm's fairy tale as having hair as black as coal and skin as white as snow, hence the name Snow White. But when the first color test came out, Walt was disappointed. Although he knew he had to portray this girl as fair complected, he thought that she looked pale and anemic, and he said, can we do something, can we do uh, maybe some pink circles on her cheeks or something? And so they tried that with a little test, and of course she looked ridiculous. Uh, she looked more like a clown. <laughs> so they didn't know quite what to do. Now the legend has it that he was discussing this in the ink and paint department where the ladies were uh, hand painting the animation cells. And supposedly one of the girls looked up and said, Mr. Disney, I couldn't help but notice, or I couldn't help but overhear your conversation. I think I have an idea. And she had a, a cell of, of Snow White that she was working on, but she reached into her purse and pulled out a little uh, dry rouge compact with a little uh, uh, camel hair brush and she put a light dusting of this uh, misty pink rouge and she said how does that look Mr. Disney and Walt said well it looks great of course but how are you going to ensure that that makeup goes in the exact same spot every single uh, cell that's painted otherwise it'll jump around on the screen and supposedly the lady said well Mr. Disney what do you think we ladies do every morning before we come to work we put on our makeup and put it on the exact same spot. Now there's some controversy whether that was a legend or whatever. But anyway, from the uh, outgrowth of that, they did develop the ink and paint department, a special dye blend that they called the blend. And you can see it applied here. It's kind of a, uh, almost an airbrush effect, but it gives her a natural rosy cheek. And that adds another dimension to the film. Um, and it was extensively used on Snow White and some of the other characters in Snow White. Um, one other interesting story about Snow White, um, it was such a tremendous success, like what happens in all businesses, the other competitors paid attention to Snow White and they said, gee, Walt hey, came up with this uh, huge hit here, is there any way we can cash in on this? Now they knew that they couldn't do animation like Walt could, he just had too far a head start on that. But they thought, well, maybe we can do some of this family-friendly uh, fantasy genre, uh, but maybe in live action. Now, movie, Goldwyn, Sam, or movie mogul Sam Goldwyn um, had purchased the rights of a book many years earlier, and he thought it would make a good movie. So he pitched the idea. He thought the time was right. He pitched the idea to MGM Studios, and he says, I've got this idea for a book, uh, idea from uh, a, a film, from this book, and I think it would make a great film. In fact, it has many of the same components that Snow White has. It has a young girl as the hero, it has a wicked witch, it has a supporting cast of little people. Of course, the book was L. Frank Baum's The Wizard of Oz. MGM bought the rights, made the film, made it in less than a year, and then released it in 1939, and you know the rest, of, of course, is history. So if you're a fan of The Wizard of Oz, like I am, uh, we probably should thank Walt Disney and Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, because most film historians think that probably would not have been made without the success of Snow White. Uh, many people don't know that little story. Um, 
There's some more interesting group of dwarves there. Sneezy is just sneezed off camera here, and they all turn around to give him a kind of a shush. Uh, this was animated by uh, one of the great animators, Art Babbitt. It's the uh, evil queen looking into the heart box there. Um, but let's go on and let's see some of uh, Walt's next feature, which was Pinocchio. Walt Disney's Pinocchio. Many people think that um, Pinocchio was probably Walt's masterpiece. It was the one film that he had, um, that he had worked on, where he had basically an unlimited budget because of the success of Snow White. So he put all kinds of money and effort into Pinocchio. Uh, it's an incredible film. Snow White is a beautiful film, but because it was the first one, it has a few rough edges. But Pinocchio was so slick, there were so many things. Extensive use of the multiplane camera. The multiplane camera was a big tower, uh, a couple of stories tall, in which the camera moved down towards the background, but there were many glass plates between, uh, hand-painted glass plates, so it gave you this, uh, this illusion, this, this 3D uh, look. Uh, and it's a beautiful effect and used extensively in Pinocchio. In fact, there's a beautiful scene in Pinocchio on, on the day where Pinocchio goes to school on his first day. There's a big uh, pan and scan movement where it, the camera comes down over the rooftops of the village and then goes down through the streets and you see the school children walking and you see birds flying up ahead. It's a beautiful piece of animation and uh, uh, the whole scene lasts about 40 seconds. Walt Disney spent $50,000 on this 40-second scene. Now, $50,000 in, in uh, 1940 was a lot of money. Adjusted to today's uh, dollars, it would be not quite, but close to a million dollars for this shot. But it's a gorgeous scene and it established, establishes the richness of the movie. Um, other things that uh, were found in Pinocchio, uh, extensive use of uh, uh, underwater effects, when Pinocchio and Jiminy Cricket are underwater and they're, they're battling Monstro and looking for Geppetto. Uh, one of the first and most realistic uh, renderings of underwater animation. In fact, when they were doing The Little Mermaid, they referred to Pinocchio to see how they created such wonderful special effects. Um, and another thing that's a, a beautiful thing about Pinocchio is the, the old world backgrounds here, they were inspired by Swedish book illustrator Gustav Tingren. Uh, but the meticulous attention to detail, again in stop motion, if you can study some of these backgrounds, you see all the, the cobblestones beautifully rendered, these little uh, tufts of, of grass here. You even have a little touch of moss growing underneath this gargoyle. These were beautifully done. This particular one, uh, one was done by uh, one of my favorite background artists, Claude Coates, um, who I had a chance to meet years ago. But these, uh, here is uh, Geppetto's workshop where Jiminy sits on some of his hand-carved pieces. Uh, it's a beautiful film, and I would say that Pinocchio probably stands up today to anything done in the modern age. If you haven't seen Pinocchio in a while, it is a beautiful film. Move down here. Now, before we get into Cinderella, the 1940 should have been probably the greatest decade for Walt Disney. He was at the top of his creative game. Um, but unfortunately, a number of things out of his control hurt the studio. In 1941, there was a, a bitter labor strike. Um, early on, the outbreak of World War II in Europe hurt his uh, European um, box office receipts, and he had counted on those for nearly 50% of his total box office receipts. Uh, so that hurt him immensely. And then when uh, the United States got into the war, basically his studio was shut down. Uh, he was uh, given the assignment by the U.S. government to do training films and, and uh, uh, propaganda and goodwill films and things like that. And he was happy to do that. He was a patriot. But obviously, those films were not paying the bills. There was massive layoffs. Uh, it was a very difficult time. Uh, some of the great classic films that we know today, Bambi, Fantasia, Pinocchio, they all lost money. So at the end of the 1940s, uh, the studio was $2 million in debt and on the verge of bankruptcy. Um, so Walt knew 
that his next film had to make money or the studio might go under. So he selected another fairy tale. He had such great success with Snow White. And don't forget, he hadn't had a real hit since Snow White. It had been all those years, over a decade. So he decided to do Cinderella. He loved the story, and it is a great film. But Walt knew that he had to do Cinderella not on the cheap, but he had to do it right on budget. So many of his films went over budget because he didn't want to compromise on anything. So he knew he had to stick to the budget on Cinderella. And one of the ways he accomplished that was filming the entire film live action with actors so that his animators could use that as reference material. That way they wouldn't have to do any animation um, duplication. They could see how it looked in live action and then not trace or rotoscope it, but use that to see what they would use or, or not use. And so everything where possible was uh, live action, uh, including the voice actors. Most people know in animation that the character voices are done first in a studio, and then the animators work around that. In Cinderella, Walt even had the voice actors um, filmed close up while they were giving their lines. And this helped the animators draw. In fact, the animators were so good in Cinderella that deaf people were actually able to read the lips of these drawings. And that was the, the high level of draftsmanship that the animators were able to do. So uh, Cinderella went on to be a big hit. And Cinderella, on a personal note, happens to be one of my favorite films. Uh, it was the first film I saw as a, a kid. I was six years old in 1958. Um, it was the second release. The first release was in 1950. Uh, so it's always held kind of a special place for me. Here's a couple of pieces of art. The one on the bottom is what we call a concept piece. Uh, before the film or the animation even begins, there are concept artists that establish the mood, the color palette, the feel of the film. And this was done by uh, Disney legend Mary Blair, who's uh, well-renowned as one of the great Disney artists. And this is the scene where Cinderella is rushing home from the ball to get home before midnight. Uh, Cinderella worked on uh, concept for um, Cinderella, Peter Pan, uh, Alice in Wonderland, and some others. She's also known for her 1964 design, interior and exterior of the theme park attraction, It's a Small World, which first opened at the 1964 World's Fair in New York. Uh, but you have a chance to see Mary Blair's original concept, and then here's the finished animation, what you see in the film. Uh, the carriage and horses running off in the background. So that's a great con contrast early on before any animation began and then the finished animation. Some more pieces from Cinderella. Now certain of these like this one for example are what we call key master setups. A key master setup is not only the cells on the background of the film but the cells themselves on the actual matching master background exactly as seen in the film. And there are very few of these that uh, uh, still remain in private hands. And we're fortunate enough to show uh, nine of them here uh, at the Peoria Riverfront Museum. Here's a beautiful piece here. This is Cinderella in her ball gown in the ballroom there. Uh, this is the iconic image of Cinderella that we all um, think of when we see Cinderella or we go to the theme parks and we see the costume characters. But what most people don't realize is if you see the film, she's really only in this gown for a few minutes in the film. Most of the time she's in her peasant dress. So consequently, uh, pieces of art from Cinderella in the ball gown are uh, uh, very rare. And uh, uh, people ask me from time to time, Steve, do you have a favorite piece of art? That's hard to say, you're, you're doing apples and oranges. Uh, but if I had to pick one, being a Cinderella fan, Cinderella in the ball gown with the special effects sparkles on a production background that's used two different times in the film in a mat that's inscribed and signed by Walt Disney himself. Um, for a Cinderella collector, it doesn't get much better than that. So uh, I guess if there were a fire at my house, this might be the one I would grab if I could. 
Here are some more all key master setups, exactly as seen in the film. Um, this particular scene is near the end of the film, and you see this one as the second to last and the fourth to the last scene in the film. Um, in the film, the final finished film, there would be three additional mice there. I have looked for 30 years for those missing mice, and I've come to the conclusion that they probably did not survive. So we have uh, Jack the Mouse there on the pile of rice, and they're looking over Cinderella at the final wedding scene there. It's a very pretty piece. Now here is an interesting piece that I have a, a little bit of a story to tell. Uh, this is the, uh, the scene in which uh, the royal courier messenger delivers invitations to the big ball at Cinderella's house. Now when I bought this piece in 1984 from my friend Stu Reesboard in Philadelphia, when I received it in a package, it was not framed, uh, and all the individual components were in, in individual mylar sleeves. But there was the watercolor background, which was beautiful, and then there was an animation cell, one layer of the, uh, the door there, because the door moves, it's animated, um, and the messenger himself, of course. And then there was a third clear sheet that I picked up, and I didn't know what it was for, and I thought maybe this is just a protective. And then I noticed in the center, there was a tiny little door handle on that. And I thought, what is this doing here? That should have been just painted on the door. And I thought about it, and I thought, surely, surely, they didn't go to the trouble of animating a doorknob, a little insignificant. And I thought, they could have made it a round doorknob. You wouldn't see any motion, or the door would open, and the door. Surely, they didn't go to that degree of detail. And, unfor and it, it kind of drove me crazy, but unfortunately, uh, at this point, there had not been a home release of Cinderella yet, not even on VHS or Betamax tape. Um, so I pondered that. But two years later, the very last theatrical release of Cinderella came out. And uh, so I was all excited, and I rushed to the theater, and, and uh, I bought my ticket, and I bought my popcorn, and I sat in the movie, and I was watching the film. I was very excited because I hadn't seen it since I was a kid. And it was a great film. And when this scene came up on the big screen, I was so excited. I felt like jumping up and saying, that's my scene. I, I own that setup. And I was so excited, I forgot to pay attention to the doorknob. <laughs> so, so I went out. I bought another ticket, another popcorn, sat through it again. And this time, I was laser focused on the door handle. And sure enough, this tiny door handle moves from that 3 o'clock position down to about 4.30 and it takes a fraction of a second. And my whole point on this thing is the richness of these films depends on these tiny details, just like the tiny details in the backgrounds. That tiny detail of animation is incredible. And I often think, you know, Cinderella is my favorite film. I've probably seen it a hundred times in my life. And I often think to myself, you know, I don't know if even I would have ever noticed the movement of that door handle had I not held the actual original art in my hands when I opened that package in 1984 from Philadelphia. So that's my uh, Cinderella door handle story. <laughs> Next film comes uh, is Peter Pan. Cinderella, by the way, was a great success and kind of steered the company into profitable waters. The 50s were a good time for the Walt Disney Company. The films made money. Uh, Walt became more involved in television, and of course he first thought up his plans for a theme park, uh, a little thing called Disneyland, which went on to do well. Uh, Peter Pan was also a delightful film, made lots of money. Um, here's a presentation piece here. Uh, this is actually the establishing scene in the Mermaid Lagoon sequence of the film. Uh, Walt Disney, uh, from time to time, would give these presentation pieces to his friends. VIPs, dignitaries, and so on. Uh, this one was given to Mervyn Cowie, did some research. Mervyn Cowie was a British uh, conservationist and naturalist, and he worked with Walt on the True Life Adventures, uh, uh, which is the, a wild animal series that uh, Walt uh, did for television in his show. The next great 50s film was a film called Lady and the Tramp. It was the first animated feature to be done in CinemaScope. 
Uh, cinemascope is a wide screen. Use a special lens that they call anamorphic lens to spread out the image. During the 50s, theater owners were very concerned about losing um, business to television. They were worried that, the, gee, if people can watch movies at home on their own televisions, uh, what are we going to do? So they tried to enhance the experience and the special sound and, and cinemascopes and so on. But Lady and the Tramp is a delightful little film. Uh, it was one of the, it was the first animated film to be nom or, um, listed on American Film Institute's list of top romantic comedies. Um, and it's all done from a dog's point of view. So if you're a dog lover, it's a great film. Here you can see, you see this, the bottom part of a chair and the furniture. A lot of Lady and the Tramp was done very low uh, uh, viewpoints uh, from a dog's point of view. And finally, we're coming to the last of the great classic fairy tales that Walt Disney did. Sleeping Beauty was released in 1959. Walt Disney had great success with Snow White. He had great success with Cinderella. He thought he would do one more fairy tale. He would do Sleeping Beauty, but he knew that the storyline of these films were very similar, so he had to do something different. And he thought, I know what I'll do. I'll make this visually an absolute extravaganza. I'll do this in CinemaScope. I'll do it in 70 millimeter film. Uh, I'm going to uh, have the audience, the viewers, be just overwhelmed in this spectacular scenery, the characters, beautiful backgrounds. It'll be the most extravagant uh, animated film ever made. And for this, he turned to his color stylist, uh, by a guy by the name of Ivan Earl. Here you see an original one-sheet poster uh, for the film. But he turned to Ivan Earl to do these beautifully intricate watercolor backgrounds. Uh, here's a piece of Ivan Earl's original concept art, sort of like what we saw with Mary Blair uh, doing the Enchanted Forest there. But if you look at these things, you notice the tremendous detail in these. And there was a little bit of rift between Ivan Earl and the animators because the animators actually thought that their characters were being overwhelmed by the backgrounds. Uh, but Walt stuck to his guns and let Ivan Earl do his thing. And it is a spectacular film. Visually, uh, it is probably uh, the pinnacle of the art of animation from a technical standpoint. The problem was it was so extravagant, it took so long, it took over six years to make took over six million dollars uh, in cost. Um, backgrounds for a typical feature, Disney feature, normally took background artists two to three days to do, a, a typical one. Uh, these backgrounds took Ivan Earl, who did many of them himself, including these you see here, um, took two to three weeks. Even the animators' drawings and the hand inking of the cells took much more because they were so the backgrounds were so intricate that the characters had to become intricate to, so that they wouldn't be um, uh, overwhelmed by the detail in the backgrounds. Uh, so it uh, took a tremendous amount of effort. It's probably the greatest film on a technical basis, but it cost so much money uh, that it never came close to recouping its cost. Uh, and I think Walt knew right then, and Walt was very reluctant to compromise ever, but he knew that he couldn't do films like this ever again. The next film done, 1961, was 101 Dalmatians. Uh, that film was done with a Xerox process. The hand inking, uh, the beautiful different colored lines was eliminated. They still painted the cells by hand, but the outlining or inking was done by a Xerox process. Uh, this is our friend Maleficent, probably one of the most, uh, oh, popular villainesses. She was designed by animator Mark Davis. And this particular figurine is not from the film. It was actually made in the uh, early 70s, but it was designed by the WED, which is the Walt Disney Imagineering people. Their model department made a few of these to display in the uh, store windows of the theme parks like Disneyland and Disney World. And so a few of them came on the market and, and I just loved the look and the detail on it, so I purchased it. And I think it, it kind of adds a three-dimensional um, you know, by-play against the two-dimensional art. Uh, but it's, a, it's really a neat piece. And 
she really is evil. You know? so. And then uh, if you'll follow me over here, we have a, a picture of Walt Disney. This is one of those classic shots when he was uh, uh, presenting in his office in the Walt Disney Wonderful World of Disney television show. He's talking about the animation. Here's some concept work from Fantasia here. Uh, here's an example of storyboards. Now, storyboards are one of the first things in animation. Um, in most cases, films begin with a script, but those early uh, animated films were pretty much a visual, sight gags and, and comedy bits. And so in 1931, a guy by the name of Webb Smith came up with this idea. He said, you know, I think it would be easier when we pitched the idea to Walt when he came in, let's just do a bunch of sketches and then pin them on this bulletin board over here. That way he can follow it like a cartoon strip. And so we have here three in sequence here of Goofy from Hawaiian Holiday. And of course, typical Goofy gets in trouble while trying to learn to surf. But the, the whole concept of storyboard was actually uh, founded at the Walt Disney Studio. Uh, after a while, live action films used uh, storyboards. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock was one of the first directors to storyboard his films. Now, of course, we storyboard everything, TV commercials, parades, uh, you name it. But it all started in 1931 at the Walt Disney Studios. Uh, here's another. This is what's called a layout drawing. Layout drawing is the entire scene, and it is kind of the blueprint for the scene. And it is the, uh, the drawing of which uh, the background artist uses reference. And you can see there's some little outlines here of Goofy and Mickey running around this pillar. In fact, there's even chase around the pillar is what this is seeing. And here is the, the field stamps and so on. But there's a lot of intricacy here. But that is kind of establishes where the characters will be in the scene. It's kind of the blueprint. And now we have a, a very fine animation drawing. Most animated characters are done individually, and they're done in layers. But in this particular case, these three uh, characters uh, were done together. But you notice the, the example of what they call stretch and squash to give uh, movement and motion. You, you see Mickey's legs stretched out there. But this is from Moose Hunters. And uh, uh, it's very rare to see all three characters like that. So that's one of my favorites. And let's see here. Here's another one of those color call-out drawings. Um, you see here, those numbers indicate the different colors of paint that would be used for ink and paint. Here's a beautiful little watercolor background. Notice the attention to detail and the little houses. Uh, Huey, Dewey, and Louie's books. They're skipping school here, and they've tossed their school books and they're going to the swimming hole. This is from Lady and the Tramp, and this is kind of unusual because uh, we have a finished animation cell of Lady like it would have been under the camera, but instead of the finished background, we have, again, a layout drawing. Uh, actually found these in two different uh, locations, several years apart, and we put them together, and they fit perfectly. They're like a key, a type of key setup. You can see how the registration is perfect as Lady looks into the, uh, the baby bed there. So you have two different um, elements of the animation process there. There's a vintage photograph of Walt talking uh, with the ink and paint ladies. Looks like they're working on Alice in Wonderland there. And finally, we mentioned we were talking about Pinocchio a while. The, the multiplane camera. There's a, the multiplane camera here, and there's the workers. So the background would be on the bottom. They'd be moving glass plates around these different things, and the camera would be on top. Well, there's the camera right there. And it would move up and down to create this three-dimensional effect. Here's an extremely early photo of a very young Walt Disney in one of his first camera stands, even pre-mustache Walt. <laughs> And then of all of Mickey's roles, probably his most famous role would be the Sorcerer's Apprentice uh, in Fantasia. And here's a, just a perfect drawing, a classic drawing of Mickey. Again, iconic images and key moments in the film. This kind of uh, 
has both of those. It's one of the best drawings of Mickey as Fantasia Sorcerer that I've seen. And over here again, we have one of those great uh, figurines done by the WED model making department. This is the Wicked Witch in Snow White, transforms from the Evil Queen. This would have been done probably in the mid 60s. It's an, an older piece. And she does look pretty evil, don't you think? Yeah. Now over here we have a, uh, a vintage portrait of uh, Walt when he was working on Pinocchio. It's a publicity photo. He was had a, one of the Pinocchio puppets here. And the original puppet was made by a guy named Bob Jones. And I actually talked to Mr. Jones years ago, and he had some great stories about Walt. And a lot of people comment, Walt in his early days was quite a snazzy dresser there, don't you think? But also Pinocchio art. Here's a, a classic Pinocchio piece where he's trapped in the birdcage. This is just before his nose starts to grow. Uh, here we have a, a set of matched pencil drawings of the Blue Fairy actually bringing Pinocchio to life. Uh, again, one of those iconic moments, key moments in the film. So uh, those are a couple of my favorites as well. And finally, we've come to the conclusion of our little tour there. I'd like to thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful time. Uh, special thanks to all the people here at the Peoria Riverfront Museum that have helped put this exhibit together. And uh, I do uh, wish you a very magical day. And of course, I hope that all your dreams come true. Thanks. <laughs>